All right, there we go. All right. Um, yeah, as Rebecca said, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we're excited to go over the um, some of the main results um, and our um, like mapping outcomes from our wayfinding amenities and interpretation studies that we've had going on this year. So um, I know a lot of people on the call have been involved in some way or another. So um, thank you very much um, for everybody's uh, input and help um, over this year. And yeah, we're um, excited to share everything with you. So to start off, um, we have the, uh, we're in a Zoom webinar format, of course, so it's a little bit different. Um, there's a Q&A and a chat function. Um, if you don't mind putting your name and affiliations into the chat, um, we'll be able to save that and uh, I, you guys can see who else is on and we'll be able to look back and see who is on. And then if you have questions at any time throughout the webinar, please put that in the Q&A section. It's easier for us to monitor that and keep track of questions than um, they can get uh, more easily lost in the chat. So we're going to start off with a little bit of background on NBRC. I think a lot of folks on the call are familiar with us, but for those who aren't, we're just going to do a really quick overview about um, who we are and some of the previous studies that NBRC has worked on. Um, and then we're going to do an overview of our all of the processes that went into the wayfinding and amenities study um, over 2024. And Jill will then give a presentation of our new interactive maps. And then we'll do just a couple minutes on some of our takeaways from the process. All right. And um, I do see a few mentioned in the chat that, or in the Q&A that the chat has been disabled. So um, I will work on that in a second. But um, just to give a little bit of background first on um, NVRC, if you want to go back one, Linnea. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, so many of you are familiar with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, but um, just to provide a little bit more detail, um, we are a regional council of 13 local governments spanning from Prince William all the way up to Loudoun County um, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., um, we are considered one of 21 planning districts that serve the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, and we serve as really a political subdivision or a government agency within the Commonwealth. Our commissioners are appointed by and from the governing bodies of our member localities, and this is on a population-based representation formula. And how that relates to the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. Um, we have been designated by the National Park Service through cooperative agreements to coordinate the Northern Virginia section. And we've been doing this for multiple decades now. Next slide. And so how does that relate to the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail? Um, again, most of you are very familiar with the trail, but if not, um, so this trail system um, was designated in a 1983 amendment um, as a trail within the national trail system. Um, we recently found out that it now spans over 900 miles um, from the Potomac River um, in Maryland and Virginia, all the way up to the Allegheny Highlands um, in Western Pennsylvania. And so it really serves as a um, comprehensive trail system that can be used for um, enjoyment of the environment, culture, and history along these different segments. And really we rely on our different land managers and other management stakeholders um, to help guide the direction of this trail and its completion. Um, so again, it is locally managed. We have over 20 management stakeholders within Northern Virginia alone um, for this non-motorized trail system. So again, it is able to serve a variety of purposes really representing the culture and um, the history of um, the Potomac region. 
And so in particular for NVRC, we do have a few specific goals for the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. Um, first is to create a connected trail system in Northern Virginia. We currently have over 138 miles within Northern Virginia, but we still have a number of gaps that we're looking to complete. Next is we want to enhance accessibility and comfort for all trail users. So finding um, accessible options and um, you'll learn a little bit more about how this is impacted by our wayfinding amenities um, within this study in particular. Next is ensuring broad input from all stakeholders regarding future infrastructure and many investments for the corridor. Um, this includes quarterly land manager meetings, um, additional partnerships to help ensure that we are engaging with all these different management stakeholders along the trail in Northern Virginia to gain their input on needs and priorities. Next is supporting and advancing access and use for underserved communities, making sure that the, this trail is accessible for all Northern Virginia residents and visitors um, in a safe manner. And included in that is improving bicycle and pedestrian safety along the trail. And really this is accomplished by creating accessible options with interconnected trails to and from communities. So I'm going to pass it over to Linnea to then go into the study. Um, yeah, thank you, Rebecca. So just a little bit of um, kind of foundational background for why we were looking at wayfinding and amenity enhancement um, through this study is uh, NBS published a strategic partnership plan for the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail um, for 2022 to 2027. And um, in that plan, there was a focus on improved branding, marketing, wayfinding, and signage. So um, folks that are coming to visit the PHNST know how to um, know how to access it and can better enjoy the trail. And um, we also conducted a study in 2022, um, and it was, yeah, this uh, health, social equity, and economic impact study. There's a QR code and a link here in the presentation. Um, but one of the, the most applicable outcomes of that study for this project is that it found that one of the biggest deterrents to participants and their families um, using the trail included a lack of accommodations. So um, parking and restrooms, for example, um, and uh, particularly for seniors and um, people with various disabilities, um, there's a lack of online information and a lack of wayfinding signage along the trail. So improvements to our wayfinding and amenities and um, interpretive signage is really key to help get more people out on the trail and have them feel comfortable on the trail. Um, and this study also revealed gaps in access points along the trail and moderately high and high socially vulnerable census tracks and um, improved pedestrian and bike infrastructure in the greater trail corridor would encourage additional use by residents. So um, this, as I said, this study really kind of helped pave the way for um, our 2024 work. Um, another kind of key foundational um, uh, not really study, but um, kind of reports uh, information um, for our wayfinding amenities is this uh, route marking guide from NPS. And um, I included just like a, a little excerpt from um, this document, but again, there's a link here if you wanted to read more, but sorry, this uh, is really sensitive. Um, basically, the um, this document outlines how important wayfinding is um, for the user experience for the PHNST so that folks can, um, they, you know, know that they're on the trail. Um, they have more of a sense of connection um, to the trail and they are, they can be very confident that they are actually on the PHNST. And the, um, this guide also has, um, you know, all of the the information for um, land managers, trail managers, for what the guidance is. Um, so, you know, like blaze standards, um, signage standards, that sort of thing to make sure that um, our wayfinding is uh, 
kind of cohesive and consistent across the whole trail. So um, our study kicked off early this year, um, kind of February, March. We had a volunteer training in the end of March and um, data collection got kicked off in April. So we had about 20 volunteers that helped us collect data across the whole page NST in Northern Virginia. Um, and during the, the training, we kind of went through some of the background of the work that we're doing, um, why we're doing it, and how to collect the field data. So um, our colleague Jill put together a survey um, using Survey123, and so we trained the volunteers on how to, to use that. And um, as part of the kind of volunteer recruitment and sign up, um, we asked folks uh, kind of if they had preferences on um, how they wanted to access the trail to do the data collection. So whether they wanted to um, walk or hike or bike, um, how long they could go out, um, if they had preferences on like difficulty of um, the, the trail conditions, that sort of thing. And so we divided the trail into um, sections or segments and uh, then assigned the segments and parks based off of volunteer preferences. And there's a QR code and link to our Wayfinding Amenities page here. Um, and I think we have links to that and um, other places in the presentation too, if you wanted to learn more. So here's just a, kind of a snapshot of um, what I guess all of the, the surveys that we collected as part of this study. So um, those 20 plus volunteers um, and you know some NPS and NBRC staff collected a total of 4,325 surveys. So again, that's across the whole PHNST in Northern Virginia. Um, about 2,500 of those points were wayfinding, um, 1,000 were amenities, um, 465 were information panels. We had another 127 that were points of interest and then 217 that were other. So um, the others were a variety of things. They could have been um, like trail washouts, um, erosion, uh, trash. It could have just um, basically been anything that didn't fit um, cleanly into these other buckets. But um, another point is if you kind of, if you add up the wayfinding amenities, information panels, points of interest and other, um, it's not exactly this total number of locations surveyed at the top. Um, it's just because there were a handful of instances where um, like an information panel may have also served as a, um, a wayfinding point. So that's why there's a little bit of a difference in those numbers. And um, we will have all of this information in our report, which we'll have finalized by the, um, the end of this week and we'll send out to you all. But here's a breakdown of our amenities. So you can at least see um, the various types of um, amenities or like the data that we collected on these um, different types of amenities here. Um, I guess benches and trash bins were the most um, commonly surveyed. And uh, that information actually, you know, when you think about um, how low the bike maintenance station numbers are, the bike scooter share, um, boat rentals, you know, that's um, also interesting information to kind of see how those are spread out across the trail. Um, so to dive in a little bit more into um, the data collection process. So as I mentioned, um, all of the, uh, you know, the trail is divided up into sections. Um, this just, these are kind of some screen grabs of what our mapping tool looked like that volunteers could use to see where their assigned um, PHNST sections were. So they were able to search um, by their uh, section number, if they were assigned parks or trailheads, um, they could search all of those through this mapping tool and um, yeah, be able to see kind of where they can park um, and what the, the trail might look like before they get out there. 
And um, the survey one, two, three app um, looks like this. My This is a screen grab from my phone. So I had a few other surveys up, but um, it was this PHNST amenities survey. And so um, volunteers just opened this. And then at each point um, where they were going to collect data, they hit collect. And um, once the, um, once each like, survey um, collection point was open, um, they could mark where they were on the map um, using this uh, the circled target. Um, and so this is essentially just to show that each point was um, very specifically geolocated. And um, then they would select from the um, detail section which amenity or signage type they were collecting. Um, and we asked that they collect, so if, um, for instance, if there was a trash bin or um, an, and a recycling bin right next to each other, we asked that those were two separate points um, to you know, make the, the data as clean and clear as possible. And then um, they took one or two photos of each amenity or signage type. Um, volunteers could also navigate with uh, where they were on the trail and if there were any points of interest, um, like a, a cultural site or a scenic view that was close by that we would like them to capture, um, they could see where they were real time along the PHNST map um, using this icon in the survey, which was really handy. Um, so these are all of the um, the different types of amenities, wayfinding, and information panels that we asked volunteers to collect. And as I mentioned, um, either one or two photos was were captured for every feature. So um, all of that data uh, turned into these um, really comprehensive interactive maps. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jill um, from NBRC, who, uh, yeah, she took all of those 4,000 some points and um, created interactive maps that will be really beneficial, we hope, for land managers and then also for the public. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I will now show you the maps that we have created that have all our findings. To get to the maps, you go to the link on the presentation that uh, was just shown by Linnea. You can also go to our Potomac Heritage dashboard and find it there. So on our Potomac Heritage Trails dashboard, you'd go to the studies, the resources, studies, and reports, and the maps are found under the Wayfinding and Amenity Study, as well as the Interpretation Enhancement Project. So once you're on the amenities, you'll just go down to the maps and explore. So the maps that we um, built with the data that we collected included the amenities maps, information panels map. Um, and then we have two wayfinding ones. We have the condition of the wayfinding as well as the type of wayfinding. So we will start out with the type of wayfinding, which there were over 2000 wayfinding points collected along the trail. So, uh, what you're seeing here is all the wayfinding that is available along the trail. Um, we had we collected it in uh, for certain types. We have the logos, which are the diamonds, the bike signs for the PHNST, the maps, um, as well as the directional signage, information panels, and the blue. So most common would be the blue bla blaze. Uh, that are along the trail. So the first thing, um, certainly you can zoom in and get see exactly where along the trail the, the different amenities are. But the first thing we'll start off talking about is just the overall coverage of our trail in our region and where there are the gaps in, this, in the signage. 
So the first thing before I go into the gaps, there were a couple of areas that were not surveyed, either because the area was closed or it was inaccessible. Those areas included, let's see, Edwards Landing Park up here in, in Loudoun County. There was no wayfinding collected there because it's inaccessible. We've got uh, Blaze Park over in Loudoun County that closed uh, for renovations and improvements, uh, which will open back up, uh, I think, in uh, the middle of 2025. And when that opens, we will collect the amenities and wayfinding at that time. And then let's see, we had one other, there was the Goose Creek segment that was inaccessible over in Loudoun County. So, so that was not collected. And then along the George Washington Memorial Parkway, there was a small segment that was not collected at um, the Chain Bridge area. And that's because there was the construction of the highway going on right now that makes it inaccessible and unsafe to use at this time. So those are not gap areas, those four areas I just mentioned, but everything else where there's big, big uh, red areas where the trail is, but there's no wayfinding, those are the areas where we have gaps and need to improve the signage for sure, such as um, in this area, this is Live Oak Drive um, in Fairfax County. Um, at Live Oak Drive, uh, a good example of the wayfinding would be uh, what we have at the northern end, which is the directional signage. And you've also got the, the signage telling you uh, that you, you'd be going to Chain Bridge and Roosevelt Island um, at this point if you followed the trail. So that is an excellent example of, of wayfinding and helping the users feel confident in where they are going and making the trail known to, to folks that it, that the trail does exist. So the wayfinding is not only for navigation, but also for promoting the trail, because one, one thing that we've known from our studies and that many of us know is people don't know the trail exists. Um, as the Potomac Heritage, they may know it as a different name, like Mount Vernon Trail, but they don't know it as the Potomac Heritage. So that's another reason to improve our signage. So in this uh, Live Oak area, obviously the entire road does not have the signage, but then even what's lacking also is the directional signage from parks such as Scott's Run, as you can see from these results. Um, on the map that is there, there is, um, there, is no, there is no signage telling people that the Heritage Trail goes along Live Oak. So that's an area certainly where there is a lack of signage that need that needs improvement for the future um, to guide to guide people. And another area um, where there is gaps that you will see from looking at the big picture would be you see how there is a huge amount up here on the northern end of the county of the region, but down from the Theodore Roosevelt Island all the way down to Occoquan, there is really a lack of signage. So that's an area that we need to concentrate on as, as a region, um, NPS, NBRC, and the ma land managers to really improve these sections of signage. So that was definitely a, a huge gap that we found uh, based on this study. Um, what you are also seeing for gaps would be, let's see, we covered Live Oak. Um, we've also got in Fairfax County, like I said, um, these areas as well. So this is Mount Vernon Highway. This is Route 1, and this is Lorton Road and Route 123, where we have very few signs. We do have some of the bike Potomac Heritage signs, which are, which are these. And since this is mainly a bike route, more of these types of signs for the bikes with, for Potomac Heritage Trail would be really nice to have along all of these sections that are shown here. And let's see, next would be like, um, another gap would be down in Prince William County that we saw is from the um, Woodbridge VRE along this existing trail over to Veter Veterans Park. 
So through the National Wildlife Refuge, the Occoquan National Wildlife Refuge, that is, there's no signage. There's also no signage through from the BRE through Belmont Bay and down. Now, where there's also no signage, um, which is understandable for sure, is places where there's there's gaps in the trail network, um, such as um, down here at um, Lee Sylvain at not Lee Sylvania at Locust Shade Park. We've only got a few signs, but we don't have the blazes yet, and that's because main. That's likely because the land manager has decided not to promote the trail in areas like this because it's not connected to the greater network yet. But once the greater network is completed, that that's an opportunity where they will likely improve at that at that point in time. That's also the case up in Loudoun County, uh, where there's no signage right now along areas where they're not connected to the greater network. Like this is a road that the Potomac Heritage Trail follows, but again, there's gaps. So there's no reason to really promote it at this time until the gaps are finished. So that's also what you'll notice from these findings. And let's see. One other area to point out where there's gaps for sure in, in the signage would be over in Prince William Forest Park. You've got it all along this portion of the trail, uh, but there's also the biking portion that is a braided part of the braided trail network where this area would be a perfect opportunity of where we could put the, the, uh, the bike PHNST sign since this is uh, bikeable route and this is not pedestrian friendly this area but a good another great example of um, places that have the opportunity to really be improved um, and another thing to point out also is uh, there are a lot of opportunities for easily uh, adding the signs in these gap areas because of other infrastructure that already exists and what you can see on our maps is if you go to our layers, we've got all these layers you can turn on and off. What we have here is the other wayfinding and information panels that exist along the trail that are not Potomac Heritage um, National Scenic Trail signs, but there are other infrastructure signs that could be utilized um, to promote the trail. Like you see here how all these light green those light green are all the other infrastructure and panel signs that, that are along the trail. So you could easily put signage like the logo on, on some of these signs that exist to, to fix the gaps along these trails. So that's not so hard to do when all you have to do is uh, put the logo um, on the existing sign panel along these stretches. And that's the same case Along like Route 1, you got a lot of bike signs. Like this one is just purely a bike sign, but you could easily add the Potomac Heritage Trail um, bike sign to a place like that. So again, all of these things, you can go in and look at the ones that are of interest to you. Next, we will talk about wayfinding at the trail junctions, because that's an important place where um, a lot of our volunteers um, and our trail users get confused. And it, so it's an important place to really have our wayfinding uh, really strong and um, in place. And so there were a few great examples in the region where, where that was. And so we'll go to places like Meadowood, where in Meadowood at the trail junctions, such as over here, you've got this trail junction here with this trail branching off. And when you look at their signage, which is the definitely the gold standard for um, the Potomac Heritage Trail signage in the region, they've done an extensive job of it. And it's a tremendous job at Meadowood for guiding people on the trails. So you'll see here, you've got the Potomac Heritage Trail logo, as well as the directional sign amidst all the other all the other trails at the junction. So this is very useful for the trail user to find their, their way easily. Um, but in other cases, other good examples 
that we had were like at Turkey Run. Um, I'll go up there. And there's so many great examples, uh, but can't go, don't want to go through um, too many of them in the interest of time, but just wanted to give you examples. Um, over at Turkey Run, you've got things like um, all these directional signs at the, let's see, at um, different places along the trail where there's trail junctions. And let's see, we can find one like over here, you've got some great ones um, with the blazers and the logo. And I know I saw some earlier uh, where you've got various trails. Um, but again, the point being that you wanna make sure that at all the trail junctions where trails branch off like in here, that you've got um, your directions at those trail junctions and not just blue blazers. Um, because there is a lot of confusion. So an example where there was a lack of signage for the directions was like over at Algonquian Park. You have this trail here, I don't know if you can see it, but this trail that's the Potomac Heritage also continues um, in this direction, but it turns and goes left here if you're going, um, if you're going north, but there was, as you can see, there was no directional signage here to let people know that it was a turn. So that's an example of where uh, from these findings, you can tell that we need to improve the directional signage at points like this, where you've got major turns that otherwise somebody would have gone, gone straight and would definitely would not have known at that point to go that way. And just one other example of where the directional was lacking I have an example up at Balls Bluff in Loudoun County, where you've got you've got major trail intersections like right here, where you've got many different trails going in all directions, and you had directional signage for like two trails, but only the Potomac Heritage was a logo. There's no mention of it on the sign, so having all trails on a sign would be the ideal way of doing things, but also having the directional signs um, in all directions. So if you're going one way on the trail, you know where to go, versus if you're going the opposite direction, you also would know where to go. But that's not the case around here where it's very confusing at a major intersection like that with many trails. Let's see, next we'll talk about the trailhead parking areas. That's another area where we really, as a region, should really strive to promote um, the trail and improve the signage. That should be our one of our highest priorities, if not the highest priority, is, is to put um, the signage of the logos, directions, as well as the information panels to promote the trails where people are parking. Um, so the fact that people don't know that the trail exists in our region, especially when they're parking at our major parks and all, that's a that's a telltale sign of the fact that the signage is lacking. So we'll look at that um, briefly. So I'm gonna, um, I'll turn on the trailheads and I'll turn off like the, the blazers so you can see more, more so um, get a better picture of where the non-blaze non signage is um, versus the parking lots. So let's see, like up here, like you see that we've got a we've got a logo at this parking lot and we've got the signage up here. But in many cases, like here you've got the you've got a logo, but um, but there's no information panel. So a logo um, tends to not be enough to get people to know that the, that a trail exists. So at places like this, we should really make um, the trail more prominent um, by having information panels, flyers, and maps, and not just the logo. And you'll see like, let's see, let's go further down and see how it is at the various parking lots. So you have like these parking lots here with an information panel. So that's a that's great. This is a great example of um, 
what what we should strive for as a region is at the trailheads where you've got the Potomac Heritage advertised and you also have a map. So this is Riverbend Park. So this is this is a fabulous example of, of wayfinding that we can strive for at other places along the trail. So like down here, there's no wayfinding at all for the for the prominent things like the logos, information panels. And so if you scroll through the map, you'll see all those different places where the, the signage is certainly lacking versus um, existing at places like Riverbend. But again, my point being that we should really focus on those areas uh, at first to be sure those are um, really well promoted it, um, so that this uh, trail can become an economic engine for our region, as well as very accessible to all the community members and residents. Um, so, so that's an overview of that the type. I'm going to now turn to doing the conditions where we know we have to improve things and for the existing stuff that is out there on the trails. A lot of um, the things that need improved would be, for instance, the blazes. And the blazes, um, some of them are very old uh, that were probably put in decades ago. And they're the, not the standard color anymore. They're not the standard blue that we are seeking. So in places like Algonquian Park, that was a great example of the standard blue, where if you go in here and just click, um, and you'll see the standard blue that's supposed to be on all the, all the trees. That's the standard in the guidelines that the National Park Service um, has published for all of us to follow. So places, there's several sections, especially Seneca Regional Park that need improved because they've got the wrong color blue. That is not the standard. So when you have the wrong color shade of blue, that certainly confuses people. Um, so if we are to brand this trail in a consistent manner, places like this are places that will need uh, volunteers to go out and do the, do the blazes. Uh, so I'm looking at, like this is a greenish, this is a greenish blue. That's definitely not the standard blue that we have today. So that type of blue is what's found along all the, all of Seneca um, Park, where you see all these yellow. And to clarify, the yellow are the fair condition. And I should have mentioned that earlier, sorry about that. The fair are the, um, yellow and the green is the good good ones and the poor ones are the red. Um, so the poor ones would be things like uh, just faded signage or faded bla blazes um, for the most part. Um, so it's important when we do the phase two study with the consultant, they will look to see are any of those uh, poor ones in locations that are should be very prominent to the trail users so that they don't lose their um, navigation, go the wrong direction or something. Are they at trail junctions or something? So if they're not at trail junctions and they're in between other ones, it's not so not so critical to fix it at this time. But again, if it's at a junction, it would be critical to fix it. And if you wanted to see like all the um, like say all the poor ones in, in our region, you can filter using this tool that we have. You can filter by the land manager. So you can know as a land manager, any of your places that need improved based on these findings, or you can just simply do like the poor condition. And that will now highlight all the poor area, uh, areas of signage along the trail. So there's quite a number of them. Um, but again, a lot of these are blazes. So you can say like, if you did not, if you just wanted to know like the poor directional signages, you can filter to that as well um, so that it doesn't show just all the blazes. So we've got the, that functionality. Um, and Jill, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can I just say real quick too, um, especially huh? applicable for the, um, anything labeled poor um, in the, the panel on the left-hand side, you can scroll down 
and find the details about the entry and um, anything labeled poor should have a description of the issue, um, if, uh, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you for that. So yeah, what you're seeing now in the wayfinding tool is for all of these, if you scroll in, it shows you just the pictures for just the area that's in your view. So for instance, in this area, we've got these pictures of the poor sign it, uh, the poor blaze blaze at in these um, locations. But also if you click on um, something, you can get the details um, like it's faded and unclear in this case um, per what Linnea was saying. So thank you for that, Linnea. And let's see, next we'll go to the information panels, which there were about roughly 475 of those along the trail. The information panels that we collected um, were of several types. They were, um, we've got blazes, uh, not blazes, but uh, I'll show you here in our legend. We've got the condition, so we um, symbolized it with good, fair, or poor condition for the information panels so that you all know which ones are in need of improvement that we could um, prioritize for the future. And for filtering, we've got that as well. Um, so if you wanted to find like all the cultural and historical signs that are along the trail, if somebody was interested and wanted to just see um, where all of those were located, as well as to know what history is being told along the trail, you can tell that by just filtering. So without filtering, like we said, we have 465. So with cultural we have and historic, we have 203. Um, so this um, mapping tool was uh, photocentric and just small maps because we wanted the center of attention to be the photos. So when you're navigating, like for instance, this, um, we've got a slideshow. Like if you started here and wanted to know everything to the South, that's cultural. Since I had culture um, selected, you could go through the slides and see everything that was cultural or historic along the trail to see what story is being told right now. And what we'll do, um, eventually is find it, figure out um, what stories are not being told that are very historical for our region that could use an information panel somewhere along the trail. So this will be very helpful in doing that now. Um, but also we have many different um, panel types that we collected. We have ones you can see like which panels in the region have Potomac heritage, um, marketing done with them, where a lot of them do not. Only 77 of the panels had had PHNST marketing associated with them out of the 465. So that's very limited. Um, and again, you'd want most of those to certainly be at the trailhead parking lots, if, if anywhere. Um, so along the trail for the Potomac Heritage, you can get a, a visual sense of like which ones were in poor condition that were Potomac heritage or fair condition, I should say, um, and not great. So we really wanna focus, especially as the highest priority, the Potomac heritage panels um, and making sure those are, are um, modernized and also in good condition. But then you've got all these other panels along the trail that may be of interest to you or others, like the visitor information, the nature and environment, uh, map panels, which maps can be helpful not only um, for guiding you on the trail, the Potomac Heritage, but also if it's a large park, there might be connecting trails. Um, so we've got all that different information as well as um, again, you can search by the land manager and know if uh, your your um, panels are in good or poor condition using this tool. And finally, the amenities. And Jill, just to give you a time check, it is 1145. Yeah, so I wanted 
Thank you. I wanted to just go through this quickly so we have time for questions and answers. But on the amenities, this is uh, something that um, the trail users had mentioned they wanted to know better and have the information for so that their trail experience um, would be better and so that they could plan for their experience and their time out in, out on the trails. Um, also to feel more confident um, in what they um, would experience and knowing um, what the user experience would be was very important to a lot of people. So we collected this information and um, we've noted uh, again, if it's which management owns the amenities and manages the amenity as well as the conditions of the amenities. And then we have all the types. So if you wanted to see specific types, like where are all the restrooms along the trail and is it, are they, um, are they, are there any gaps where we should have more restrooms or, or one of the other amenity types, this, this tool can help us decide that uh, as a region. Um, so we've got, it's great to have all this now, especially for the users. And it's in this tool, the amenities are. And over the, um, by December, all the amenities will also be added to our Potomac Heritage um, maps that are on our dashboard um, for the visitor experience and the trail characteristics. So all of these will be transferred over to those existing products um, here in the next month or two. So, so that's everything I have. So I'll stop sharing and we will take questions since we've got 12 minutes for questions. And I think Lene had a, a few more slides to share before we do so, but please feel free okay. to put any Thank questions you. into the Q&A box and we can answer them afterwards. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, fly through these last couple of slides um, quickly. So, um, we have time for questions, but as I put in the chat, we'll have a we have a final report that's almost finalized, um, which we will get sent out. It'll be posted on the website, and then we'll send it out to um, all of you who, all of you all who attended as well. Um, it will provide a lot of the study background that we've already discussed, um, an overview of the survey data, um, all of the links to the online maps, um, some of our takeaways and preliminary findings, um, many of which Jill touched on in her presentation. Um, we have some information on like next steps, and then um, we'll have various appendices, and one of them that I think is really helpful is our feedback from volunteers. Um, so both in the comments for the various surveys and then um, via email, volunteers provided uh, a lot of um, really excellent feedback. So um, we have all of that detailed. And uh, I'll just say really quickly, we focused um, on the wayfinding and amenities piece. Um, Jill also showed the maps of um, the interpretive panels that we have, but we had separate funding um, from the National Park Foundation to do interpretive enhancement. So um, we've worked with various groups um, to, to collect a variety of resources on um, kind of where there are gaps in signage um, and the maps are really helpful for that. And um, we got feedback from various groups on kind of what sort of information or stories they felt had been left out of exist existing signage. Um, and through that process, we developed um, five signs um, that will be replaced hopefully in the coming months. Um, I guess three of them are brand new. Um, there'll be two at Occoquan and one at Lee Sylvania. And then there will be two signs um, at Loudoun County Parks um, that will be improved. So um, we have the kind of initial blueprint of signs that were there, but after um, uh, there have been some name changes in Loudoun County, um, we worked with NPS and um, Loudoun to kind of revamp those existing signs. So there's more information on um, our dashboard under the Interpretive Enhancement Project. 
So um, Jill covered a, a number of these takeaways. They're more fleshed out in our report. So um, please feel free to refer to that once it's out. But the interactive maps uh, are really helpful at at least showing some of these preliminary gaps and where improvements could be made. Um, there will be a phase two of this study that um, will go much more in depth on where um, opportunities for improvement are and how we can go about that. Um, that, will, that study will be um, led by a consultant um, and is coming soon. Um, Again, as Jill mentioned, existing signage infrastructure along gaps um, provide really great opportunities to add more PHNST logos and blazes. Um, one of the big takeaways that we found were the inconsistencies in the PHNST blue. And um, again, there's a picture here to the left, um, BLM's uh, Meadowood area really serves as a gold standard of very clear and consistent PHNST wayfinding. Um, a few lessons. Uh, we so we conducted the um, surveys from April until uh, really the beginning of October, um, which was a wider uh, time frame than we had initially expected. So um, for anyone going through this process, um, definitely take uh, the potential for volunteer dropout um, throughout the the study process into account when you're. Um, working out timelines. Um, I saw, in, uh, looking through the participants today, that there were a number of volunteers um, who tuned in today. And thank you so much. Um, the volunteers who uh, were able to make it out did an incredible amount of work. Um, some of them spent multiple days, at least um, everybody spent at least half a day out there. So we really appreciate that. Um, we found that iterative data review and cleaning is really helpful. Um, so as the surveys were coming in over this year, um, I did an initial uh, like quality control check of all of them. Um, and that helped make it so, you know, even, um, you know, there was still kind of a crunch time leading up to the webinar and the report to do final cleaning, but um, doing it along the way uh, kept us from having to go through all 4,000 points within a very short period of time. So doing that iteratively um, helps with time management, but then also catching um, if there's any confusion um, and kind of miss uh, uh, categorizing of um, different types of amenities or signage uh, that could be addressed um, while volunteers were still going out. Um, and uh, just another quick thing that we you know, we found some confusion um, or like inconsistencies in the way that um, some of our, our data categories were interpreted. Um, and so uh, trying to make, um, make it as clear as possible, um, adding information um, into the surveys that volunteers could go back to, uh, like as reminders or clarification, I think would be um, a, a helpful change in the future. Um, we recently developed this uh, brochure um, about different, uh, like kind of natural points of interest along the peach NST in Northern Virginia. This is available online if you're interested. And um, all of the information that we've covered today is available on our dashboard, um, the QR code, and the link is here. Um, we'll send out this presentation afterwards and um, all of these resources, um, the link should be available for you to reference. Okay, I think that's everything. Um, please feel free to, to jump in with questions. Any questions? Um, let's see. Looks like any have been answered. I can look in the chat as well. Um, I think one thing that you know we would also love to hear from you all that are listening in is if there's anything else that you would also like to see within this interpretation plan. So um, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, I think you're also able to uh, raise your hand and we can take you off mute if there's anything else 
um, you're curious about um, seeing in there um, or any additional comments that you have um, or remarks from this. But uh, again, we hope everybody will take some time to go through those wonderful maps that Jill created um, because there's a lot of really useful information for our land managers in there. Um, it looks like we have a hand up from Thomas. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Thomas. There we go. You should be able to come off mute. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, my, my question is, though, too, is what is the best way? Um, so through going through the, the map and going and looking at different ones um, to uh, when we're updating this, what is the is there a certain portal or a, a way of like a you know, contacting a certain individual or whatnot that's best to like help update this map and keep it current. Yes, I can answer that, Tom. I, I would be the main point of contact for everybody who manages the trail and main, does the maintenance, um, such as yourself, uh, to provide me with the updated data as things are improved over time. Certainly, uh, that's uh, what we would aim to do, is uh, to keep track of everything that's been improved since this study has been is um, done so that we can see over time uh, how much progress we are, we are making as a region. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? And we'll be sending out this presentation as well as the slides and all the resources afterwards. So um, as you're taking a look through it, if any additional questions do come up, definitely feel free to email any of us as well. Maybe we'll give it like 20 more seconds and then uh, we can close out though. But thank you all again. Okay, I think we'll take the silence as a sign. Um, Linnea and Jill, anything else to add before we close out? Um, no, I think just uh, thanks again to the volunteers. Thanks to all of the um, localities and land managers who sent um, updates for the report. Um, yeah, we really appreciate all of your feedback and um, for all the support we had on this project. Thanks to everyone for all your support. For sure. Uh, I'm going to 